The Tallahassee Museum Red Wolf Pups are about to have a birthday, but they can't eat cake. The idea was that they'd tear the pumpkins apart on camera, but it's been a busy day, and even after a year, the wolf family isn't comfortable in front of people. We'll see them tear into some stuff later, I promise. The red wolves have the possibility of being released in the wild, so we take a much more hands-off approach. And that's one reason these wolves are so shy. We don't do anything to cultivate a trust between the red wolves and us. And that's a good thing. In April of 2017, the Tallahassee Museum welcomed four red wolf puppies. The pups have to be both captive and wild, which is one of the many challenges facing those trying to return them from the brink of extinction. And part of that is not letting the wolves trust people. Over the last year, they've grown to trust me just enough to let me stand on the boardwalk with a camera and not always hide from me. So I've been able to see some things. In addition to being endangered animals and apex predators, they're a great little family. And they're fun to watch. Here is their first year. Take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our I think they're amazing animals. One of my favorite moments is in the morning when we clean, and just this morning, all six were out, watching them run together as a family. The wolves were villainized for so long, so we've had like Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood. So for people to come out and see that they really act like a, a family group is, is pretty neat. You know, they're not such a villain. They're, they're just trying to get by in this web of life that we have. And also being able to, you know, identify the individuals and see just different things with their personality is so cool. Dad's the biggest, so, you know, big, perfect wolf is, is what he's like. <laughs> Everybody else is in kind of like their lanky teenage phase. <laughs> uh, Mom is definitely a little bit wider. Oh. Mom, she also is pretty hunched. She'll always be kind of hunching down. I and mean, then she's a little more red-toned. Can you tell them apart, the pups? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, for the most part, sometimes I have to look more carefully. Luckily, they have microchips. We have our brave puppy, so he's out with mom and dad a lot. He has a distinctly shorter tail. He's pretty dominant for a couple months now. He's been hanging out with mom and dad and seems like they're teaching him the real ways of the world, I guess. The one female has incredibly dark lips um, right around the bottom of her mouth. The female is smaller and darker for sure. She's, she's pretty easy. The other two I have a harder time with. The other two look very much alike. And there's one puppy that kind of has a crick in his tail. And then there's a puppy that's extremely shy. The pups are almost full size now. They grew so fast, much quicker than your average puppy. So I don't think people understand when they hear that there's puppies that they're not gonna be super tiny little cute fluffies. I first met the wolf family just before the pups were born, a little over a year ago. We have two pairs of wolves right now. We have a male and a female that are siblings, and the male happens to be crypt orchid, so he's sterile anyhow. And um, we have them off exhibit. And we have a pair of wolves that have mated now. We picked up a female that came from North Carolina about three months ago, I guess. And we have had a number of wolves here over the years. We've had three litters born here. We hope we're gonna have a litter this year. We're thinking, we're pretty sure that, we're, that we got bred this year. There was actually a group here doing a late night Valentine's tour and they happened to see them mating. Our last litter was 13 years ago, so 
predated me, so this has been an excitement for all of us here. It had been the 13 years. Those two in the back were born in 2005. You might wonder about these other wolves behind the main exhibit. 13 years ago, they were the museum's puppies. He thinks you're playing them, huh? <laughs> we are in our back wolf habitat. Our two 12-year-olds are in here, a brother and a sister. The male had been to different zoos and he had different breeding partners over the years, but the female has actually been here her whole life. Before that, we had a litter in 2003. Both of those litters had five puppies, but it had been 13 years. The pairs that we'd had before, um, we kept getting hopeful. We've uh, set cameras up for a couple years and would uh, go through nights watching that, sitting up all night long, watching a camera, being excited, and then turning out to be a false pregnancy. We have two cameras on this habitat, and as a company, they, they store to the cloud. And uh, we, can go, we can go online at home and, and see what these animals are up to. I actually would sleep with my laptop nearby, and so I actually woke up when the first puppy was born and hearing the different noises and just instantly started texting everybody at like 3 a.m. or whatever time it was because, what, there's a puppy, there's a puppy. This is the only footage that exists of the first two months. Them dreaming, you know, little movement while they're sleeping is really precious. Nursing with mom. When they started to come out of the box and out of the den, um, when they'd hear the other wolves howling, just those little itty bitty puppy howls was pretty cool. They are adorable and fun to watch, but their future isn't entertaining museum visitors for the rest of their lives. At least, it's not supposed to be. These animals were bred to be wild. Red wolves were once found in the southeastern United States. They ranged all the way from Texas down into Florida, up the coast to Virginia and over to Pennsylvania. So they had a huge range. When the European settlers came, they decided that large predators, they didn't want to have them around. They considered them a threat to the children and livestock and that kind of thing. So we were very hard on the red wolves. And in the early 70s, a federal biologist named Curtis Carley realized that the red wolves had disappeared and they were nearly extinct. Starting with just 14 wolves, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began a nationwide breeding program. So they started talking with zoos to see about, you know, putting breeding pairs out in different places around the country. And we really thought it was a, a good fit for us because the red wolf was native to this area. The focus of the Tallahassee Museum is the Big Bend region of Florida. Since we're focused on the panhandle of Florida, that's the wildlife that we exhibit. We exhibit native North Florida animals. So any animal that lived here could be considered an animal that we could display. In addition to over 40 captive breeding facilities, there are sites where wolves can transition to the wild. And then that's why we have the island propagation projects too, like at St. Vincent's. What we would do is get them onto their natural diet, like hog, raccoon, deer. And once they're eating that well, they release them on the island, and they learn how to hunt and be wild wolves. And when they have pups out there, they're raised by the parents, so they're raised in the wild. There's a pair of wolves out there that, that have a yearling pup right now. The majority of our animals are non-releasable for some reason. But with these guys, we have to follow the federal government's regulations. So we can't do a lot of training because they're candidates to be released. With other animals in our collection, when we have to do a medical procedure, we would talk soothingly to them and reassure them and that kind of thing. With the red wolves, when we vaccinate or whether, we just catch them up and stick them and let them go. We make them think that we're bad news. There are several reasons for that. One is it's, it's easier for them to make the transition back into the wild in a safer form if, if they don't trust people. The 
first time I visited the pups, they were hiding. When the mom first had them, she was digging a new den all the time because she was trying to protect them from us. So she would put them underground. Our goal was to not let them get too far. They can dig pretty deep, pretty fast. Um, we've had them probably go at least 12 foot overnight. Since we are dealing with them, uh, the endangered species and they are vulnerable, we need to have eyes on them. So we need to, especially when they were puppies, we had to check them pretty much every week or every couple days. This is mom's second litter, but it's dad's first litter. So he had a little bit of anxiety about it, trying to be a really good dad and protect them. So once he was able to see that they were down the dirt den, he seemed like he felt a lot more comfortable and relaxed a little bit. So we did let them keep a den for a short amount of time. But yeah, that was a really big one, and that was definitely a challenge to get them out of. We had a couple times with this litter right here that they got so deep underground, we had to send a, a small person head first to get the puppies. We had to like tie ropes on people and pull them back out. And we even had a, a girl who is an experienced cave diver, um, and she was like, yeah, no, this is too far, too tight. I can't go down there. I spent three and a half hours there that day, and this was all I saw of the mom. You know, with the previous litters that we had, the parents weren't as shy as these parents. These guys were getting really nervous, and this was the male's first litter. Um, so we wanted to give them every chance for success that we could, so we closed off the bridge, and we asked people to be quiet around here, and we just gave them some time. When I came back a month later, the den was filled in and the pups were in the house. It was a little too crowded for mom, so she had to stay out. But since she's had the puppies, she's become much more, much more shy and she's taught the puppies that. And they can come out and be out and she'll make a little <laughs> and they run and go back down the den or whatever. Mom being shy. It would be an advantage that she, you know, could protect puppies more. You know, she's listening to everything in her environment for things that are dangerous to her babies. And she wants to make sure that her babies survive and join her pack. But their shyness, I mean, it's a good thing. The mom and dad are just trying to protect them and, and tell them that, that humans aren't good. <laughs> During my next visit, the pups hid in the woods and mom whined. The time after that, we put a camera on both entrances to their house. It seemed they were getting shyer. They're just doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, hiding out underground in a den. Mom and dad took really good care of them, keeping them as wild as possible. The animal staff has fun making treats for the wolves. Yeah, it's definitely my favorite part of the job because you get to be so creative. You know, you try to put it together in a way that they haven't seen it before. Meat-filled pumpkins, palmetto-wrapped fish treats, not what red wolves would eat in the wild. And yet, this kind of thing encourages their wildness. You want to encourage those natural behaviors, things like digging, hunting, ripping, tearing, all that kind of thing. We want them to be able to do things that they would do in the wild. If an animal's just sitting in the same space day after day, they explore it and there's nothing really new to see in there. So we try to present them with items that they'll interact with, items that cause them to use their natural abilities. It's called environmental enrichment. Sometimes we use spray. You can buy raccoon urine or a different type fox urine. We have like a bunch of like the perfumes, lots of different like Spices. We have like whole containers. A very exciting coyote urine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, different types of urine, red fox, raccoon, that definitely gets a pretty high reaction out of them. All the urines here. Woo! So it's anything that'll okay. help bring out a behavior, whether it's a little bit of um, caution in, say, a, a prey animal, 
Um, you can put in a scent of a predator. You never want to make anybody scared, but that caution is always a good natural behavior. A little venison sausage lets them exercise their hunting and stalking instincts. They are an apex predator and they prefer white-tailed deer if they can catch them. And that's the reason we have so many white-tailed deer now, because we've eliminated the natural predators. We took away their natural checks. So that's, that's a big function of the predators is to keep populations in balance. When you start taking out a whole species of animals, it's going to leave a void and whatever niche they fill is not going to be occupied. Stalking something, chasing. Then it can be something as fun and simple as having a popsicle on a hot day. So we come up with some odd popsicles out of fish and blood and chicken jello and things like that. To make a nice, tasty blood popsicle for him. <laughs> awesome. Helps make them have a good day. This log was added to the exhibit just before the puppies were born. The stump behind me, this log, is a good example of environmental enrichment. We're going to put this in the habitat with the red wolves. It's a big log and it's hollow. You could probably put three or four people in there easily. So we anticipate that the wolves are going to be enjoying this because they naturally go into dens and things. So that's, that's why we got this log here. One of our keepers found it, and our head keeper and she decided that would be a good thing for our wolf habitat and she made arrangements and had it delivered to us. I'm the crazy one who looks around town for weird objects or things that uh, somebody might not see a second use in. Um, kind of a recycling nerd so always trying to find a, a second use for something. So that was a very large um, oak tree that fell in Hurricane Hermine. Um, the gentleman who owned the house was very wonderful and um, actually cut it like that de and delivered it. So we were very lucky. The staff mixes up their treats. So what are these from? Um, these are horse bones. Yeah. So horse knuckles, nice and big. And then we also get ribbons out. There's some of the ribs. They're gonna get about a dozen of them today. So they're gonna be pretty excited for that. Cool. Yeah. And if one has something that the other one wants, you might see some teeth showing, <laughs> you know, letting them know this is my bone, you know, please stay back. <laughs> Next comes one of my favorite experiences here. They just love the sound of sirens. That is the one thing that we've ever heard or found out that will set off the wolves howling is a, a siren of some sort. They sound wild, but would they make it outside of captivity? These pups may not get a chance to find out. Every year around July, they have the red wolf 
planning meeting. So all the institutions with wolves usually get together and they discuss who's going to go where, the benefits, the genetics, and, and everything that needs to happen. So all we knew was we had puppies and we would find out what would happen sometime around July of this year. So I imagine they may go into other zoos to help for breeding um, since it's kind of unknown what's happening in North Carolina right now. Well, I mean, it was so important. They they had that release site that they thought was going to be really great. Um, they didn't think there were coyotes in the area and, you know, it was on so many acres. And, and the program did really, really well out there. I think it went from 100 releases and it was a very sustainable population at 225 for some time. But they had some, some uh, coyotes slipping into the population and allowed the local people to hunt those coyotes. And they started shooting red wolves by accident and so they had to stop that program and right now they're they're waiting to get instructions from the uh, u.s fish and wildlife service about where to take the program from here but it is still the most successful predator recovery and reintroduction of any carnivore in the world so it's been a very successful program i've covered a lot of efforts to help or reintroduce animals facing extinction None of these are species we'd find scary. Red wolves are different. Well, particularly wolves, the historical reference to them. You got Peter in the wolf, and the three little pigs in the wolf, and little red riding hood in the wolf. The wolf is always the villain in these stories. And that affects the way people feel about an animal. When I first met this family, they were getting ready to welcome new pups. There won't be any new pups this year, but it's spring and their instincts are driving them to make safe spaces. They have started digging a lot recently. The mother nor the puppies were doing much digging for months and months and months, but now that it's springtime, I think they have a lot more instinct to just start digging. Even though we know she's not um, bred and she's not having puppies this year, we're finding the past month or two they are starting to dig a lot. So I think it's just a natural thing. Springtime comes, they want to dig a den, and they just feel like they need to do it. It seems like the females do more of the den digging, so I'm not sure if that is our mom showing our female pup what to do or, or not. We need to probably set the camera back out there again and see who's doing, who's causing the trouble. But we, we fill them in every day to make sure nobody gets out of our reach. <laughs> we don't mind the little indentions, they're little sleeping, sleeping holes, but we don't want them getting deep underground. That's year one for the Tallahassee Museum's Red Wolf family. Their species fate in the wild is unclear. People love small puppies in a zoo, but would they welcome the predator back into the Apalachicola National Forest, where they like to hike and camp? How many of us would like to see this animal run free as it once had in nature, atop our local food web? If the red wolf disappeared, the human race would continue on. It's kind of a philosophical question, you know. Do you feel enriched because we have black bears and animals living here in the wild? Or does it not make any difference to you at all? You know, some people could care less whether these wildlife existed. But I think complete people, they're aware that, that we aren't the only thing living here and that everybody needs to have the space and the ability to make a living. So we just have to realize that we share this world with many creatures and it's important to generate feelings of care and compassion for them. And that's one of the things that we do out here is people can come see them in a more natural setting, watch them digging, watch them shredding something and, and realize, hey, this is a special animal and it has an important role and it, it needs to be in our world because that's the way things are meant to be. This special is part of an ongoing effort to cover our area's ecology. For more on local plants, animals, waterways, and geology, and the ways in which they all tie together, visit wfsu.org slash ecology blog. Magnolia trees greet the southern breeze in the land where rivers wind. Seeds that spring up from the past leave us treasures yet to find. Where our children play along the land our fathers build hands take a moment now look around the paradise we have found take the local roots and journey down the roads we call our home